Hey everyone, this is a chapter from uh, Paul Bull's book, CLR James, Artist is Revolutionary. The chapter I'm reading is uh, titled American Bolshevik in 1838 to 53. And, uh, yeah. For 15 years in America, James, the self-interpreted Leninist, gave his full attention to the revolutionary movement. He made no public forays beyond the usual left-wing party-sponsored lecture series or a rare university address. James's work appeared in no popular journals, not even those like Dwight MacDonald's Politics with a decidedly like-minded political cast. Writing under a half-dozen pseudonyms, living the somewhat shadowy life of the small Marxist group leader, James firmly abandoned the semi-celebrity status he had achieved in Britain as a cricket journalist and prominent Trotskyist spokesman. It is a measure of his seriousness that his political eclipse disturbed him, disturbed him not in the least. For one thing, James had a rich and complex of sometimes deeply disturbing private life. Despite his commitments, many of his personal friends, among them Richard Wright, James T. Farrell, Carl Van Vechten, Ralph Ellison, Meyer Shapiro, and even Norman Mailer, were artists or critics rather than politicos. James devoted his free time to absorbing the popular culture of films, Harlem Entertainment, and de the detective novel. James wrote a play for the black actress Ethel Waters. James courted for almost a decade and finally won a woman of extraordinary beauty who bore his only child, and he experienced the intensity of unsettled romantic affairs as if his precocious theoretical perspectives on modern women's emancipation merely added to the explosive quality of of private liaisons. James' followers similarly might be seen as a self-conscious combination of the political and the personal, people who found in the ambiance he encouraged a chance for making revolution in society and simultaneously in their own lives. All this constituted a full existence, specifically compared with the generally narrow lives of fellow Marxist intellectuals and contemporary left political thinkers. James left it behind, perhaps at the appropriate political moment, only under extraordinary protest. No part of his biography has remained so, his biography has remained so obscure. But equally, none has seemed to him so full of intellectual accomplishment or personal satisfaction. For this one moment, James attained the multiplication factor of enduring radical comradeship at the cent very center of advanced capitalism. James authored his most formidable political and theoretical as opposed to historical or cultural works, however small the immediate audience. James has believed ever since that had he stayed, he would have been able to act with considerable influence upon coming American events, such as black power which reshaped world revolutionary forces. That very influence, ironically, would have been incongruous to the movement he was forced to abandon in America. He later reached across the decades toward the new left, but mostly with assumptions and language that made his message difficult for ordinary radical youngsters to imbibe. He would indeed be rediscovered. Excuse me. He would need to be rediscovered. More than James realized, the unresolvable paradox of intellectual success and apparent political failure and political failure and apparent theoretical success rested upon the general status of the American left. That left had always been, in its more self-consciously Marxist elements, an immigrant movement, first and second generation obscure to the wider public. It operated with occasionally occasional wide impact by acting through and upon the outbursts of workers. Likewise, through and upon the deeply cultural currents of native reform. It interpreted change around it, often brilliantly, and it acted with influence vastly beyond its numbers, but it consolidated nothing and slipped away once more into isolation to be revived only by a later generation. James and all his immediate political work fell within this pattern even at a critical turning point of the left's Americanization. To, 
an extent that the avid anti-Stalinist James could never fully grasp, the entire left grew, flourished, and disintegrated as one. The ideological fine points, which mattered so much to intellectuals of all fashions, struck no chord with America at large. James's group, determined to abandon the dogmas of left organization for the richness of popular life, nevertheless sunk with the rest of the left movement. James the Trinidadian had the special advantages of classical training, pan-Africanism, and a modern eye for the meeting points of economics and culture. But tragically, James emerged in an, in an era of mostly left-wing defeat and reformism. The question of socialism, which James might have been able to raise in a creative fashion, had all but disappeared from the public agenda, even for those who sought to overthrow capitalism. James had no way, and until his last days in America, fighting against his expulsion, no real compulsion to reach directly the popular audience that might have made better use of James's wisdom. James found himself trapped by the very intensity of the small group activity which supported him. Literary projects of real potential and creative value for himself went unrealized. Time ran out on alternatives. James departed America on terms different from Trotsky or Bukharin, 30 years earlier, returning to a revolution, and equally unlike his friend Richard Wright, fleeing racism, he was a fond sojourner driven from what had become his would-be adopted land. Exile from America would in fact be the remaking of his public literary and pan-Africanist political career, almost as he had left off in an earlier life and a different Europe. How the American experience made that latter success possible is a subject developed behind James's own fertile consciousness. Encountering U.S. Trotskyism Of James the Immigrant in 1938, ostensibly visiting on a six-month visa between cricket seasons, American Trotskyism had never seen the like. Despite Trotsky's political predilections, the, quote, Negro question, end quote, remained a mystery suitable to discuss only in relation to communist errors. Of culture, Trotsky inclined intellectuals around the Partisan Review, for instance, knew plenty, but they had already begun a phased withdrawal for, into aesthetics. Popular culture they viewed, as did the old Bolsheviks, including Trotsky himself, as mere diversion of the masses from political consciousness. In Trotskyism, singularly among American Marxists, one likewise found an open attack upon Marxism's Hegelian philosophical underpinnings, premises which James would come to defend with fresh readings of the masters. One moment. Trotskyists, bitterly split among themselves, united only in their hatred for Stalinism and in their utter faith in the concept of the vanguard party. Excuse me. Trotskyists, bitterly split among themselves, united only in their hatred of Stalinism and in their utter faith in the concept of the vanguard, which James would spend his best efforts attacking. No wonder his factional foes regarded James as a, quote, stratosphere. Stratosopher, S T R A T O S P H E R I S T, a quote stratosopher, stratosopher, and quote mystic, a maker of hyperbole and a bit of a charlatan. At first glance, he was to American Trotskyism as chalk to cheese. In human terms, however, one must imagine a mini movement. Barely a hundred members with a trail of factional wars in their past, freshly organized and expectant for new forces. Trotskyists had taken a national leader or two out of the American communist movement in 1928, led some important strikes, and begun to publish respectable journals. But every success had turned into its virtual opposite. 
Amalgamation with a group of homegrown Marxists, led by socialist minister and later pacifist luminary A.J. Must in 1934-35, barely added to Trotskyism's forces, so numerous were the defections and so flagrant the internal quarrels. A foray into the Socialist Party, faithful to Trotsky's own vision of a, quote, French turn, end quote, by Trotskyist into the major centrist socialist movements of the day, quote, captured, end quote, an energetic youth component. Meanwhile, the organization of the CIO, as American Trotskyism's foremost leader put it, quote, passed over our heads, end quote. They had been locked out of the most decisive institutional events in the generation, confined to the unorganized peripheries of agricultural workers or to the AFL stronghold of the Teamsters. They poised themselves for a comeback, but they began the game with the new Socialist Workers' Party of 1938 immeasurably far behind the Communists. In this situation, James must have seemed to Trotskyist almost as Daniel de Leon had to the fumbling and isolated Socialist Labor Party of 1890, a phenomenal asset. Educated Americans had already heard of the author of The Black Jacobins and of World Revolution, reviewed favorably in the New York Times and in Time magazine. American Trotskyists had by no means expected, however, a black man who had a better grasp of classical history, of European culture, and above all of the role in American life, excuse me, of the black role in American life than any among them. Quote, I constituted the third world in the Trotskyite party, end quote, James has written in his unpublished memoirs. With due respect to the remarkable array of self and college educated thinkers, tr James was a true cosmopolite among abstract cosmopolitans. He recalled later his first U.S. public engagement, speaking at length in New York about the European situation, without notes, quoting extensive statistics from memory. The Trotskyists set him out immediately upon a national speaking tour and once an education for him in American conditions and a rare opportunity for Trotskyists to reach beyond their limited numbers to a public crowd in a church or hall. Who else in their ranks save Trotsky himself would have been invited to debate Bertrand Russell and by vote of the audience have defeated that famed logician in political logic? Constance Webb, a Los Angeles teenage political activist entranced by his ideas and bearing, recalled later encountering the speaker as a figure of physical grace and veritable symbol of revolutionary promise. Quote, his dot 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 neck curved forward like that of a racehorse in the slip dot dot dot. But as with highly strained athletes, the tension was concentrated and tuned, so that he gave the impression of enormous ease, dot, dot, dot. The impact of his first sentence was astonishing, dot, dot, dot. He was our captive, and we were a captivated audience, dot, dot, dot. Toward the end of his speech, the blacks in the audience began to respond, their voices punctuating each telling point. The words met half-buried ideas, which had been struggling to emerge. Here was the broad, wide world of imagination and heart. Here was an international movement, end quote. Uh, Constance Webb. And here was a compelling personal understanding of the race problem eating away the heart of American democracy. James seemed to Webb, and James certainly seemed to others, a man poised to articulate what had been in the minds of black and white listeners pondering the significance of the race dilemma. To them, therefore, this anomalous West Indian Brighton, quote, understood more about the American scene than any of the American comrades, end quote. Sorry, there was a, there was a note, but uh, I think this... Uh, journal has end uh, notes as opposed to footnotes, which I find irritating. Anyway, shit. here almost immediately James struck his first and most memorable political chord in America. 
James met with anti-communist black intellectuals critical of the New Deal, such as the editors of the influential weekly Pittsburgh Courier. James quickly learned from readers of the Black Jacobins in Harlem that Trotskyists had become known as the single left organization which had no apparent position on blacks. Valuable time had already been lost. The earlier insistence of communists upon a, quote, black belt, end quote, nation had never been a realistic position. The popular front shift, muting of communist criticism on the British and French empires and away from colonial events altogether, had disillusioned many. But only black nationalism, and black nationalism's especially raw anti-Semitic form, had been able to benefit. The fading Socialist Party, even where it had exceptional contacts in the South, had long since placed its hopes in the labor bureaucracy. Positions to the left of the Communist Party remained vacant. James already shaped his alternative. Blacks themselves would act upon American democracy, and in the process, blacks would transform the prospects for socialism. Trotsky, who had privately come to the conclusion that without a forceful answer to the black question, this, his American egg followers would wither away, hastened to, summon James, hastened to summon James to his exile residence of Coyoacan. Um, how do you fucking pronounce I always forget how to pronounce that. It was very little... Excuse me. It was very likely the first time since leaving Moscow that Trotsky met with a self-confident political equal. James was certainly the first non-white Marxist of such stature whom he had known since Comintern days with the Indian leader M. N. Roy. James venerated Trotsky's contribution, but he gave no ground. Nevertheless, he was charmed by the most almost aristocratic appearance and manners of Trotsky and Natalia, by the former Red Army leader's facility with languages and his fearlessness about known prospects of assassination. Blacks, James insisted in his prepared document for the summit meetings, had become by experience and condition more motivated for anti-capitalism than any other American sector. However, their trajectory demanded agitation for democratic rights before agitation for socialism. Above all, it demanded a movement in their own and not in some left party's name. On that basis, the dialectical relations between black nationalism and black consciousness could be mediated. Trotsky, who had previously framed the black question as if it were a problem of some national minority in Russia, grasped the importance of James's formulation but not its full implications. Trotsky could not shake the essentialism of the vanguard, blacks and whites speaking to blacks who would propose the immediate agenda to the masses and declare with one voice, quote, we are the fourth international, end quote. It was a characteristic difference destined to grow in time. And yet it is remarkable how much the two agreed upon. James insisted that Leninism in the United States although to this point mainly in the Communist Party, had added something new to the political equation by treating the black as a comrade rather than a stranger. As Lenin had observed in regard to colonial workers, quote, no concession can ever be made, end quote, by Marxists to racial prejudice. The common turn of, the Trots of Trotsky's day, although hardly in debt to Trotsky himself on the question, had already made this serious contribution. Second, as James and his comrades had showed in the internal, International African Service Bureau, and especially in their manifesto against the Munich Pact, support of revolutionary struggle for African independence would be critical for any future English language movement. A weekly paper and pamphlet, a weekly paper and pamphlets of a book, pamphlets of a black organization, a truly international monthly edition of international African opinion, initial agitational efforts in specific sectors, domestic service, agricultural workers, and industrial unions with black membership, and on given questions, unemployment, discrimination, rents, etc., all these projects Trotsky supported or did not oppose. 
James and Trotsky shared with different weights upon various aspects of a tradition, transitional program, the conception of international and U.S. capitalism so devastated that democratic and economist struggles for specific aims would snap a weak link. How else could an organization of less than a thousand members imagine sweeping over and past a communist party of 55,000 cadre and a following of a quarter million more past a democratic party of traditional working class loyalty with the eroded but stubbornly rooted charisma of Franklin Roosevelt as its centerpiece? James had begun to doubt the efficacy of the Trotskyist model. To his question of how the French Trotskyist movement could flounder while the working class upsurge continued, Trotsky offered what seemed to him all too pat assurances of inevitable political development. These reservations were political, not personal. After the leader's assassination, James would pen a formidable tribute to the man he considered one of the great historians of modern times and a strategic mind second in rank only to Oliver Cromwell and Lenin. But James had one strategic agenda which Trotsky only partly, partly shared. Bolshevism as a wedge for pan-African uprising rather than vice versa. Perhaps the plan set out for a black radicalism with Trotskyist influence might indeed have sparked a great flame in a few years amid the rise of the black industrial worker and race relations to central significance. Surely the black movement and the black population could have utilized an alternative to the Communist Party, growingly popular but mainly among Harlem's cultural elite, on the basis of a middle class oriented integrationism. Perhaps, on the other hand, Trotskyists might have failed in hundreds of little ways, as did communists, to persuade ordinary blacks of their good intentions and of their struggle to change American society. Certainly, they never approached the numbers required for a mass movement. The imagined black movement might in that sense be compared to the international artist organization FIARI, F-I-A-R-I launched with great optimism in 1939 by leaders André Breton and adhered to by such notable non-communist U.S. Marxists as Bertram D. Wolfe. Um, I'm going to read uh, André Breton's uh, Wikipedia uh, intro right quick and Bertram D. Wolfe's because... I want to be experts. I believe André Breton uh, was a communist, then a Trotskyist, and then an anarchist in France, and was the uh, initiator of uh, surrealism. Oh, well, the internet's not working, so. Uh, Fiori, too, would have organized, or rather encouraged, the organization of artists in their own behalf, with Trotsky's support and ideological insistence. The artist movement died with the Second World War and collapse of independent left perspectives. Okay. Uh, André Robert Breton was a French writer and poet, the co-founder, leader, and principal theorist of Surrealism. Breton's writings include the first Surrealist Manifesto of 1924, in which he defines Surrealism as, quote, pure psychic automatism, end quote. Along with Breton's role as leader of the Surrealist movement, Breton is the author of celebrated books such as Nadia and Ornadja and Le Mort Fou. These activities combined with his critical and theoretical work on writing and the plastic arts made André Breton a major figure in 20th century French art and literature.
God, my computer sucks. I'm gonna blow it up. Um, and it says Bertram Wolf, uh, David Bertram Wolf was an American scholar, leading communist, and later a leading anti communist. He authored many works related to communism, including biographical studies of Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Leon, Leon Trotsky, and Diego Rivera. And it says here that the International Federation of Independent Revolutionary Art, FIARI, F-I-A-R-I, was a short-lived organization established in 1938 following the publication of the Manifesto for an Independent Revolutionary Art, which was signed by André Breton and Diego Rivera, based on their political and cultural rejection of the Communist International. It was likely co-authored by Leon Trotsky. Um, back to the text. In 1939, the clouds overhanging revolutionary perspectives did not look so dark to the Trotskyist faithful. They had, as a political party after all, just begun. The Socialist Workers' Party convention of that year after severe internal discussion duly affirmed the necessity for a black movement, not subservient to the Socialist Workers' Party, but participated in by Trotskyists. Blacks were, according to a convention resolution, destined, quote, by their whole historical past to be, under adequate leadership, the very vanguard of the proletarian revolution, end quote. James called it, quote, one of the high points in the history of our American revolutionary movement, this decision of our recent convention, end quote. The party duly established a department of Negro work. As, quote, J.R. Johnson, end quote, um, that's James's uh, nom de guerre, or pen name, uh, James himself wrote a weekly column in the article, sorry, in the official Socialist Appeal, A New Departure in Trotskyist History. James wrote both for the party faithful and for the wider readership of the appeal. To the former especially, James placed the question of black struggle at the center of U.S. Marxist movement's intellectual and political maturation. The chauvinism of society infected the radical movement until Trotskyists themselves could see that the, quote, majority of Negroes will fight for a new society with a vigor and endurance that will be surpassed by no other section of the American workers or farmers, end quote. No political progress could be made reaching ordinary blacks. The Communist Party had only belatedly under international pressure, set out a program for blacks. Their half-heartedness and the political stultification of the Communist Party made that effort a tail on the kite of Moscow's needs. <laughs> Trotskyists likewise had delayed an approach until directed to do so by international leaders. Now they faced a supreme challenge. Quote, Having broken with bourgeois ideas, we must vigorously create our own, for if we do not, bourgeois corruption will come pouring in on us again. So consciousness and a complete so conscious and complete a break with American bourgeois ideas about Negroes has never been made in America before. Dot 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 only a Marxist party can even attempt it. End quote. Seemingly for the wider Trotskyist following, he savaged the communist manipulation of liberal opinion. as in the Communist Party's vigorous protest against the film Gone with the Wind. James urged blacks to oppose world war, and he discussed southern lynchings and black sharecroppers. James wove together labor and color themes in a basic statement of Socialist Worker Party policy, <laughs> describing, describing the Russian Revolution as the great event in the world history, because the Russian Revolution posed the prospect of worldwide emancipation from colonialism. 
In short, James emerged as one of the foremost Trotskyist theoreticians, a veritable guide to districts where the movement had never gone before. Within a year came a disastrous split in Trotskyism, the assassination of Trotsky and the outbreak of war. From those blows, the organizational aims of Trotskyist organization among blacks never recovered. James's criticism of the Socialist Workers' Party circulated in mimeographed form foreshadowed both the division and James's lineup within it. Trotskyists waited for workers and blacks to join them as if, quote, agreement with Lenin's principles, end quote, had created, excuse me, had ceased to be a principle of action and became an end in itself. The Socialist Workers' Party already slipping backward in membership from 1,000 to merely, excuse me, to barely 800, might be the second party in the world built along Bolshevik ideological lines, but it, quote, is not composed of Bolsheviks like those Lenin-led, dot, dot, dot. There is a limit to ideological victory over material conditions, end quote. James was not seeking to be negative, but the American triumphs of Trotskyism seem to have consisted mostly of factional forays among the socialists, quote, and the pounding of political opponents into a proper docility, end quote. The working class cadre, such as it existed, quote, operated more like trade unionists in the party than party members in trade unions, end quote. Reinforcing membership passivity and leadership bureaucracy. Concrete investigations of the anticipated American working class constituency had never actually taken place. Foreign-born workers, a key segment, tended to be seen as if stripped of identity. The Ukrainian-born worker, mere interest, more interesting if he stayed in Russia, where he would still be part of the intellectually absorbing, quote, Ukrainian question, end quote, than in Detroit. Quote, we have to break out of this, end quote, James concluded, 17 closely set written pages, quote, or be condemned or, quote, or be condemned to forever eating up each other or pounding each other in the name of, quote, principled, end quote, Bolshevism, end quote. James had already begun his project of Americanizing Bolshevism, first of all himself. James un James's unsettled plans to return to England to stay on in America had been changed by via Donievskaya party name, quote, Freddie Forrest, end quote. Ten years his junior, a veteran of the communist movement and its earliest black interventions in the 1920s, Donievskaya had participated widely but remained an unrecognized intellectual talent within Trotskyism. As a childhood immigrant from Russia, she knew the language well. Even before she met James, she had fixed her ideas about Stalin society as a form of state capitalism. No mere, quote, bureaucratic society, end quote, as liber liberals, socialists, and former Trotskyists had begun to argue, subject to the class conflict and economic crisis characteristic of capitalism. Compared to this position, all other Trotskyist critiques amounted to a waiting game, waiting for Stalin and Stalin's bureaucracy to fall or to be thrust out by some loyal descendant of the old Bolshevik party. A dynamic revolutionary view had to place inevitable crises at the center of, quote, state capitalism, end quote, as well as capitalism proper. Dunievskaya convinced James that such a position helped make sense of capitalism shift in the West, toward a more bureaucratic society inside the labor movement and outside. Together, Dunievskaya and James would work out the ramifications. Dunievskaya and James would form a group or, quote, tendency, end quote, within Trotskyism to argue out their position. It was the cue James had subconsciously awaited. A few years later, James would write privately with pride, quote, I have a few close collaborators. They are doing magnificent work. They are young and full of enthusiasm, dot, 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 end quote. What did it mean psychologically for James to choose America? James recalled his first visit south where in New Orleans white women unabashedly eyed him, quote, like some sort of movie star, end quote, prompting 
one kind of nervousness and up through the segregated cities where he slowly and with some anxiety learned the victim's etiquette of racism, another form of anxiety. H.L. Mitchell. Let's see who that is. Uh, H.L. Mitchell was an American Union leader. He was a co-founder and leader of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, STFU, in 1934, and led its successor unions for most of the next 26 years. H.L. Mitchell had been a sharecropper himself and a socialist like his fellow instigator of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, Clay East. Mitchell, excuse me, the STFU led an initially small racially mixed union of poor people with three years to a membership, within three years to a membership of some 30,000 tenant farmers and sharecroppers. As the STFU evolved through association with larger, more powerful unions, it changed its name and Mitchell's official role. Mitchell was president of the National Farm Labor Union, NFLU, then of the National Agricultural Workers Union, NAWU, before retiring in 1960. In 1979, H.L. Mitchell published a memoir concerned almost entirely with his organizing activities. So... H.L. Mitchell, the redoubtable leader of the Southern Tenant Farmers Union, likewise remembers James in deeply racist Mobile, Alabama, riding at the front of the public bus, asking the driver directions, quote, just as if he belonged there, end quote. Numerous personal observers, whites, blacks, and Asians alike, would remark to James that he did not act like a Negro. This was... That was a weakness in the long run in many ways. He could not put himself fully in the mind of the Afro-American, but it was a great advantage in the short run, for he could share vicariously in the greatest popular black upsurge since the days of populism, this time expressed in popular music and dance as much as in politics. Without the nagging recollections of past defeats, American blacks held in their collective memory." <laughs> James could project his fantasies of American freedom and, above all, women's freedom into the personality of the woman he loved and into his relationship with her. He could carry himself as the foremost black Marxist in a time when Harlem had become a world center for black culture. England had nothing to compare. A handful of young Trotskyists sensed all this. Flexibility toward black culture overlapped with a flexibility in cultural and personal matters matters in a left which had generally treated them with formulae when it treated them at all. Interviews with Trotskyist Young in the late 1930s suggest the depth of the personal and social cultural influences that drew individuals toward the direction of James, toward the directions James was taking them. Among those who would cleave closely to James in particular, the struggle for self-development, a life of politics and art is especially striking. Many had passed through the Young People's Socialist League either via family correction, excuse me, connections or from an instinctive rejection of Stalinism's youth and student movements. They flaunted a mild bohemianism even as they gave their energies to workers and to unions eager for aid. They craved creative self-expression even as they pronounced themselves a little uneasily to be true American Bolsheviks. One second. Leah Grant Dillon, niece of prominent Yiddish poet and herself a modern dancer, describes her youthful identity as one of the, quote, evil trio, end quote. Three young women, a little notorious among their political circle for their artistic inclinations and their sardonic sense of humor. Like so many other Jewish youngsters of lower class origin reared in neighborhoods where boys dreamed of being another Heifetz and girls playing piano like 
Arthur Rubinstein. She was amused to be told by Trotsky's leaders to, quote, industrialize. I don't know who those references are. Yasha Heifetz was a Jewish-American violinist widely regarded as one of the greatest violinists of all time. Born in Vilnius, Heifetz was soon recognized as a child prodigy and was trained in the cl Russian classical violin style in St. Petersburg, accompanying his parents to escape the violence of the Russian Revolution, Heifetz moved to the United States as a teenager, where his Carnegie Hall debut was rapturously received. Fritz Kreisler, another leading violinist of the 20th century, said after hearing Heifetz's debut, quote, We might as well take our fiddles and break them across our knees, end quote. By the age of 18, Heifetz was the highest paid violinist in the world. He had a long and successful concert career, including wartime service with the United Service Organization, USO. After an injury to his right bowing arm in 1972, he switched his focus to teaching. So that's who Heifetz is. And Arthur Rubinstein. It's Arthur Rubinstein, apparently. Arthur Rubinstein was a Polish American who Arthur Rubinstein, who lived from January 1887 to December 1982, was a Polish American pianist. Arthur Rubinstein is widely regarded as one of the greatest pianists of all time. Arthur Rubinstein received international acclaim for his performances of the music written by a variety of composers, and many regard Arthur Rubinstein as one of the greatest Chopin interpreters of his time. Arthur Rubinstein played in public for eight decades. Um, so back to the text. Like so many other Jewish youngsters of lower class origin reared in neighborhoods where boys dreamed of being another Heifetz and girls of playing piano like Arthur Rubinstein, Leah Grant Dillon was amused to be told by Trotskyist leaders to, quote, industrialize, end quote. Leah Grant Dillon's family never had, until her generation, had the option of leaving industry. Marxist movements of all kinds typically offered a mixture of private artistic inclinations and public workerist philistinism, interwoven through the friendships of the time. Trotsky's personal interest in art meant surprisingly little in political practice. James provided a lifeline of sorts though his dia through his dialogues and his personal encouragements. Constance Webb, his most constant correspondent and wife-to-be, had the most extraordinary experience of all with him. Um, Constance Webb. What's it say? Come on. I don't see a Wikipedia article, but I see a something from The Guardian. Uh, Constance Webb led a remarkably full life as a committed political activist, a fashion model, an actress, a writer whose works include the first biography of her friend Richard Wright, and the wife and confidant of one of the foremost intellectuals of the 20th century, C.L.R. James. And, uh, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, Bula called her uh, beautiful, and I can't disagree. <laughs> it's almost constant correspondence and wife-to-be had the most extraordinary experience of all with James. Young Trotskyist, distinguished model, Hollywood in Jen and Starlet, stage actress, intimate of Richard Wright, 
she sought to make her own creative life both through and against the particular origin urgings of James. Encouraged by him to literary analysis, she was she finally produced the first bi biography of Richard Wright. I don't know who Richard Wright is. Uh, Richard Nathaniel Wright, who lived from September 4th, 1908 to November 28th, 1960, was an American author of novels, short stories, poems, and nonfiction. Much of his literature concerns racial themes, especially related to the plight of African Americans during the late 19th to mid 20th centuries, suffering discrimination and violence. Richard Wright's best-known works include the novella collection Uncle Tom's Children, published in 1938, the novel Native Son. Okay, I know that novel. Uh, I don't know if I've read out what it's about, but I know the, the name. Uh, 1940, and the memoir Black Boy, 1945. Literary critics believe his work helped change race relations in the United States in the mid-20th century. Constance Webb also gave up a promising film career and never lost the sense of opposition from other leaders of the political group. As his own letters detail, the questions of artistic expression permeated James's own thoughts even, perhaps in an odd way especially, when a combination of political and personal problems seemed most overwhelming. Stan Weir, whose name I recognize, but I don't know. Okay, it's showing me um, a link for a hockey player. Um, yeah, it says, uh, Stan Weir, who lived from 1921 to 2001, was an influential blue-collar intellectual, socialist and labor leader, a rank-and-file worker for most of his life. Weir worked as a seaman in the Merchant Marine during World War II, as an auto worker, longshoreman, truck driver, and painter, before taking a position at the University of Illinois, where he taught courses to, lo to union locals. Politically, Stan Weir was a leading figure in the, quote, third camp, end quote, tendency of Trotskyism, and was a member of the Workers' Party and its successor, the Independent Socialist League. The character Joe Link in Harvey Swado's novel Standing Fast was based on Weir. In the 1980s, Stan Weir co-founded Single Jack Books, a publishing house for worker writers. A close friend to James Baldwin, Stott, in Lind and C.L.R. James, Stan Ware was at the forefront of much of the labor movement during the second half of the 20th century. Interesting, man. Stan Ware, an int back to the text. Stan Ware, an intimate admirer, if never a member of James's group, offers an obverse example of the West Indians' appeal. Son of, son of a seamstress maid at a Hollywood mogul's mansion, her safe self later remarried to a prominent black jazz musician, Ware grew up on another fringe of working class and bohemian life. Coming of age in 1940, deeply drawn to literature and increasingly radical, he left UCLA to join the Merchant Marine. There, Stan Ware met old wobblies and syndicalist-minded Trotskyists who educated Ware to working class resistance and to the history of the left. Trotskyist he remembered as, quote, the guys who read the best novels, end quote. Man's Fate. Uh, Fantomara. This Javanet. Guide and Rilke. Orthodox Trotskyism seemed to him fatally compromised on the war issue, in part as an arrangement. Ah, uh, come on. Computer. in part as an arrangement with sympathetic union leaders, but also simply uninterested in culture. With James uniquely, Ware would be able to talk class struggle in a new key. 
the telos of working and lower middle class people who had absorbed the highest capacity for cultural advance he and James found refracted, if not in literary interest, then in the blue collar affinities which is popular film such as popular film and jazz dance. To Stan Weir, fictionalized as uncompromising protagonist of Harvey Swatto's On the Line, and working class hero of the same author's Standing Fast, James personally signified the potentiality of self development. It says Harvey Swatos was an American social critic and author of novels, short stories, essays, and journalism. Um, what was the book's called? Harvey Swatos on the Line. Uh, on the Line is a classic of the literature of work. On the Line, excuse me, a classic of the literature of work. On the Line reveals the essential vision of a writer who, almost alone of his generation, portrayed American families and factories with empathy, compassion, and intelligence. Swallow's important essay, The Myth of the Happy Worker, has been included as an appendix. That's what it says on this website. I'm not going to read the. Uh... One about standing fast, but I assume it's in the same genre of writing. Um, new section. Uh, James as political leader. James's talent for leadership received its first test within a year after he personally opted for America. The Hitler-Stalin Pact and the approach of war brought a Russian invasion first of Poland, then of Finland. American communists suffered an unprecedented blow to influence in the East European communities most directly affected, notably those very Ukrainian Americans James viewed as an ignored case in point, also Poles and more obviously telling to party prestige the all-important Jewish Americans. Trotskyism tutored on Trotsky's own defense of quote deformed end quote but a but a still authentic socialism in Russia. Um, The, the word that Trotsky typically uses is degenerated. Um, Trotskyism tutored on Trotsky's own defense of, quote, deformed, end quote, but apparently still authentic socialism in Russia, came apart on the question of the ha those hapless districts the Red Army invaded. <laughs> Had these become, quote, socialist, end quote, societies, simply because private property had been confiscated by the Russian state and its clients? Or did the plain, plainly authoritarian character of such societies err not simply to betrayed revolution and revolutionary party thrown in doubt Trotsky's basic categories? James felt drawn to organize around an answer. Behind this central theoretical controversy lay others more subtly developed. The internal life of Trotskyism, always uneasy, had also come apart on the class question eternally endemic to American radicalism. By the late 1930s, the Communist Party had very nearly become a middle-class movement, especially in its most public manifestations. To be sure, Communist Party control or influence in a dozen important industrial unions was its fundamental strength but it recruited and held on to relatively few ordinary unionists. Other factory militants remained, up to this point at least, personally respectful of communists who brought them unionization, but somewhat skeptical on larger political questions. Membership leaped ahead in New York State and California, where the party had penetrated the political mainstream, whether through an American Labor Party or the Democratic Party. Around the new masses... And through the lower rungs of the New Deal, communists rallied intellectual opponents of fascism to their own circles.
Um, New Masses, 1926 to 1948, was an American Marxist magazine closely associated with Communist Party USA. New Masses succeeded both The Masses, which existed from 1912 to 1917, and The Liberator, which existed from 1918 to 1924. New Masses was later merged into Masses and Mainstream, which existed from 1948 to 1963. With the coming of the Great Depression in 1929, America became receptive to ideas from the political left, and New Masses became highly influential in intellectual circles. The magazine has been called, quote, the principal organ of the American cultural left from 1926 onwards, end quote. I don't know who said that quote, but... Uh... Barbara Foley said that radical presentations, politics, and form in U.S. proletarian fiction, nineteen twenty-nine to forty-one, is where that quote is from. Anyway, back to the text. Uh, Trotskyists considered themselves immune to the politics of the Popular Front, but they were hardly immune to similar developments in other forms. Trotskyist influence upon the industrial working class outside the Twin Cities. Minneapolis, St. Paul in general, and the Teamsters in particular, had always been scattered. The main source of expanded influence among workers came from the, quote, colonizers, end quote, predominantly eastern middle-class youth who headed outward to the factories. The foray into the Socialist Party, an organization which, an early Trotskyist infiltrator noted, had more YMCA workers than industrial workers, netted more of the same type, Often the children of former communists or socialists who had advanced themselves into small business or the professions. At the first outbreak of dissension, whether theoretical or practical, the leadership of the Trotskyist movement blamed the Socialist Workers' Party's trouble on petty bourgeois anxiety. Um, the, for instance, uh, check out, I mean, I haven't put it up yet, and I don't know when I'll put it up, and I don't know what the order of things will be, like, um, but I'm currently reading uh, In Defense of Marxism, which is like a compilation of Trotsky's critiques of the workers, uh, what would become the Workers' Party within the Socialist Workers' Party, um, people such as Abern, um, Burnham, and Schachtman. Eventually, the working class cadre would arrive until then, faithfulness to Trotsky's own program guaranteed the necessary continuity. But James, among many others, never accepted this wisdom. Quote, Engels and Lenin insisted, end quote, James had written in 1939, quote, that Marx deduced the inevitability of socialism not from the negation of the negation, but by an observation of socioeconomic phenomenon. Few of us go any further, and it is a crime to encourage the membership to pretense and hypocrisy. This, says Trotsky, is Bolshevism. His advice is, whatever the errors and mistakes, follow Socialist Workers' Party leader James P. Cannon. The answer is no, unequivocal and undilute, undiluted and without reservation. Agreement with Lenin's politics did not make anyone ipso facto into a Bolshevik. Incompetent politics can be defended only by bureaucratic rudeness and disloyalty, dot, dot, dot. On the, quote, organizational quest, end quote, a turn is necessary. We shall make it, in loyal collaboration with the majority or without them, but made it shall be, end quote, James. James had, he testified, initially been drawn to that grouping and its followers outside New York in the industrial centers, which taught, quote, the things that cannot be learnt in books, end quote. Experience had taught him otherwise. In short, and in practical terms, the class question within the movement could no longer be allowed to determine the status and future of the movement. <laughs> If creative Trotskyists had to begin with an unlikely crew in order to become an American revolutionary movement, James did not quite say, but quite obviously implied, then so it would be. Parenthesis, I asked him 40 years later if the odd homogeneity of the Workers' Party, almost entirely petty bourgeois and Jewish, had not seemed to him a daunting obstacle. He replied, 
With all the other obstacles, we could not even take the question up. End parenthesis. Race and race sympathies, he might have added, had helped show the way forward already. In 1940, James and the great majority of youth recor recruited earlier from the Socialist Party, now split from Trotsky and the Socialist Workers' Party on the question of war and the nature of the Soviet Union. They would henceforth appeal for and play, with their sister tendencies abroad, most of which barely existed, a central role in creating a, quote, third camp, end quote, compo opposed to capitalism and Stalinism. Their, under, their outstanding leader, Max Schachtman, and his lieutenant, Martin Abern, had themselves come from the upper echelons of the 1920s Communist Party youth. Now they led what amounted to a children's crusade into the new Workers' Party. One second. Um, Martin Marty Abern was a Marxist politician who was an important leader of the communist youth movement of the 1920s, as well as he founder of the American Trotskyist movement. Very handsome fellow. Um, what's a children's crusade? It's like in capital letters, so I'm assuming it means something. Um, the Children's Crusade was a failed popular crusade by European Christians to establish a second Latin kingdom of Jerusalem in the Holy Land, said to have taken place in 1212. Although it is called the Children's Crusade, it never received the papal approval from Pope Innocent III to be an actual crusade. The traditional narrative is likely conflated with a mix of factual and mythical events which include the preaching of visions by a French boy and a German boy, an intention to peacefully convert Muslims in the Holy Land to Christianity, bands of children marching to Italy, and children being sold into slavery in Tunis. The crusaders of the real events on which the story is based left areas of Germany, led by Nicholas of Cologne and northern France, led by Stephen of Cloy. I don't know. Obscure reference, if you ask me. I don't fucking know. Maybe that appeals to nerds, but I guess I'm not quite nerdy enough to appreciate it. Schachtman and his lieutenants had fostered a movement against Stalinism more than for any other, another clearly articulated position. They hoped, quote, expected, end quote, would be the correct word, to restore the purity of Bolshevism in a place where it had never truly existed, where its steadfast supporters by 1940 were basically a mixture of aging immigrants, still in the parentheses, still in the Communist Party, end parentheses, and politically green intellectuals. Surprised by the pace of the Russian Revolution, Lenin had nevertheless at his disposal a Bolshevik party and against him a tottering dynasty. American Trotsky has faced a New Deal fading but still vital, with widespread support including sections of the left, and a capitalism, with all its current problems, the most powerful single force in the world. And yet America held promise. As James and others read the Bolshevik experience, the key had been the Soviet workers' councils. Nowhere in the world did those seem more likely to recur in some form, than in the United States with its ultra-advanced industry and its still young CIO. True, the labor leadership, parenthesis, including the communists, and parenthesis, had begun drifting rightward with their very accession to power. At the very core of democratic unionism, the United Auto Workers, communist local presidents and shop stewards set themselves upon the problem of learning how to, quote, stop strikes, end quote, so as to effect a disciplined response and to coalesce influence around their own candidates for leadership. Other industries where the left had greater or less influence experienced the same development. 
already the democratic uprising had become, where not successfully stifled, rebellious toward the consolidation of bureaucracy. The approach of war and the prospective imposition of government controls threatened to put into place a tripartite arrangement of government, industry, and union leadership against working class self-expression. Up to 1940, the Trotskyist militants had been able to do little more than, quote, suffer like hell, end quote, in the words of a sympathetic Detroit observer and air their complaints bitterly, sometimes with the unideological support of ordinary workers and sometimes not. Here and there, Trotskyist militants might lead a small-scale action, occasionally even outside Minneapolis and the Teamsters, as in the syndicalist-minded, if also patently racist, Siemens Union of the Pacific, an AFL competitor to the communist-controlled West Coast CIO-dominated sea trades, they became central to the administration of a particular international. Generally, they stood on the outside looking in. But the war that the Trotskyists had so vigorously opposed nonetheless opened possibilities hitherto only imagined. For one thing, anyone not drafted could get an industrial job. The Communist Party, shortly after Hitler's invasion of Russia, placed itself utterly against industrial conflict, opened the door wide to competition. By this time, no substantial non-Trotskyist competition even existed. The Socialist Party barely survived, and the, quote, right communists, led by J. Lovestone, formally dissolved, erstwhile militant labor leaders suddenly became, quote, industrial statesmen, end quote. Rose from modest origins to heights from which they would not return. The new workforce had little reason to view them with adulation, and good reason to cock an ear toward a different kind of labor radical. The depth of popular anti-war sentiment, voiced by traditional congressional conservatives, pacifists like Norman Thomas and by the communists in 1939-40, to 40, had long been deep, and widespread, based in part upon revelations of war profiteering 20 years earlier, in part upon a residual feminism. There's a new name here. It says, uh, Jeanette Rankin, Congresswoman of Wyoming, voted against entry into both world wars, and in part upon the American distrust of big government, the feeling persisted despite rising patriotism. It says, uh, Jeanette Rankin, who lived from 1880 to May 18th, 1973, was an American politician and women's rights advocate who became the first woman to hold office in the United States. Jeanette Rankin was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives as a Republican from Montana in 1916 for one term and then was elected again in 1940. Rankin remains the only woman ever elected to Congress from Montana. Each of Rankin's congressional terms coincided with the initiation of U.S. military intervention in one of the two world wars. A lifelong pacifist, Rankin was one of the 50 House members who opposed the declaration of war on Germany in 1917. In 1941, Rankin was the sole member of Congress to vote against the declaration of war on Japan following the attack on Pearl Harbor. A suffragist during the Progressive Era, Rankin organized and lobbied for legislation enfranchising women in several states, including Montana, New York, and North Dakota. While in Congress, she introduced legislation that eventually became the 19th Constitutional Amendment, granted, granting unrestricted voting rights to women nationwide. Jeanette Rankin championed a multitude of diverse women's rights and civil rights causes throughout a career that spanned more than six decades. Uh, 
It says, uh, back to the text, to cite only one prominent example, America's foremost historian Charles Beard, suspicious of Roosevelt's maneuvering and government suspension of many civil rights, whether demands upon business, labor, or hapless minorities such as the Japanese Americans, denounced the system. Um, it says here that Charles Austin Beard, Charles A. Beard, who lived from 1874 to 1948, was an American historian and professor who wrote primarily during the first half of the 20th century. A history professor at Columbia University, Beard's influence is primarily due to his publications in the field of history and political science. Beard's works include a radical reevaluation of the founding fathers of the United States, whom he believed to be more motivated by economics than by philosophical principles. Beard's most influential book, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, published in 1913, has been the subject of great controversy ever since its publication. While it has been frequently criticized for its methodology and conclusions, it was responsible for a wide-ranging inter reinterpretation of early American history. An icon of the progressive school of historical interpretation, Beard's reputation suffered during the Cold War when the assumption of cla economic class conflict was dropped by most American historians. The consensus historian Richard Hofstadter concluded in 1968, quote, Today, Beard's reputation stands like an imposing ruin in the landscape of American historiography. What was once the grandest house in the province is now a ravaged survival, end quote. Hofstadter nevertheless praised Beard by saying he was, quote, foremost among the American historians of his or any generation in the search for a usable past, end quote. I knew that guy's name. Yeah, Richard Hofstadter. I knew his name because of uh, Eric Foner, who's like a prominent U.S. historian. And I think Eric Foner, I'm not exactly sure about this, so don't quote me on it. But I think um, Richard Hofstadter got his job uh, because Eric Foner's father lost his job during uh, the Red Scare. And then... Eric Foner was uh, Richard Hofstadter's uh, student leader. Um, I'm not sure about all that, but I believe that's in like Foner's biography, which I just had to read for unrelated school reasons recently. Um, so anyway, back to the text. Overnight, Beard received press and academic slander, predicting the Cold War efforts by such noted liberal historians such as Arthur Schlesinger Jr. to finish off his refuta reputation. But not all dissent could be intimated away as Nazi sympathizing. It says Arthur Schlesinger Jr., was an American historian, social critic, and public intellectual, a son of the influential historian Arthur M. Schlesinger Sr., and a specialist in American history. Much of Schlesinger's work explored the history of 20th century American liberalism. In particular, his work focused on leaders such as Harry S. Truman, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, John F. Kennedy, and Robert F. Kennedy. In the 1952 and 1956 presidential campaigns, he was a primary speechwriter and advisor to the Democratic presidential uh, nominee Adlai Stevenson II. Schlesinger served as special assistant and, quote, court historian, end quote, to President Kennedy from 1961 to 63. 
He wrote a detailed account of the Kennedy administration from the 1968 presidential campaign to the president's state funeral, titled A Thousand Days, John F. Kennedy in the White House, which won the 1966 Pulitzer Prize for biography or autobiography. Arthur M. Schlesinger, Jr., in 1968, actively supported the presidential campaign of Senator Robert F. Kennedy, which ended with Kennedy's assassination in Los Angeles. Schlesinger wrote a popular biography, Robert Kennedy and His Time, several years later. Schlesinger popularized the term, quote, imperial presidency, end quote, during the Nixon administration in his 1973 book, The Imperial Presidency. Um. Time for a break. Likewise, industrial unrest, which continued on through the late 1930s and actually expanded in the war years, the replacement workforce of migrant southern blacks and whites Women and others knew little of the earlier informal work groups established in the CIO's first years. But as such units were grouped, the spirit of resistance against unchecked employer prerogatives caught fire and even spread to sectors previously unorganized. Industrial actions offered a particular benefit to blacks and to women long treated as second class workers. The strike pattern nevertheless posed an ambiguous phenomenon for any in interpreter. The United Auto Workers, in particular, workers for the United Auto Workers, in particular, tended to vote patriotically for contracts banning strikes and then to engage in them anyway. The education of a new industrial species and regeneration to class struggle proceeded for the most part willy nilly. From 1942 onward, strikes mounted in raw numbers, workers involved in hours lost. By 1933, strikes had reached an all-time level. Beyond all these considerations, the wartime society steadily embraced a democratic and even sexually and racially egalitarian to an unprecedented, if still limited degree, rhetoric of world crusade. Radicalism, as so often in America, now consisted in the popular demands to bring reality in line with rhetoric. Even a small group could react with volatile effect upon such prospects. React they did. The minuscule Workers' Party published a weekly newspaper with a claim of 50,000 circulation, including a special West Coast edition of 10,000 and another 10,000 in Buffalo, New York. The paper agitated around issues the Communist Party had abandoned for the duration, wage freeze, inflated local prices, organized racism, and against the general bureaucratization of CIO unions that the Communists often viewed as a positive development. This proved to be American Trotskyism's most hopeful moment. In retrospect, the ambitious collection of youngsters who constituted a germ of future neoconservatism Its intellectuals included Irving Howe, who edited the weekly labor action for a time, later novelist Harvey Swatos, Fortune magazine journalist Dwight MacDonald, art critic Lionel Abel, philosopher James Burnham, and numerous later notable others. I don't know who Lionel a a Abel is. Lionel A. Bell, who lived from 1910 to 2001 in Manhattan, 2001, was an eminent Jewish American playwright, essayist, essayist, and theater critic. Lionel A. Bell was also a translator and was an authorized translator of Jean Paul Sartre, who called A. Bell the most intelligent man in New York City. His first success was a tragedy, Absalom, staged off Broadway in 1956 and winner of the Obie Award. It was followed by three other works. 
of drama before he turned to criticism. He is best known for coining the term metatheater in his book of the same title. He was one of the signers of the Humanist Manifesto, too. By the end of the 1940s, through its peripheries would pass Saul Bellow, Gertrude Himmelfarb, Richard Hofstadter, I think Richard Hofstadter was a uh, historian who was like the thesis advisor of Eric Foner. Clement Greenberg. <sighs> Among a crowd of brilliant young Jews, James recalled the frequency of psychoanalysis among the daily topics of casual conversation and the prevalence of Brahms on the record player. A more unlikely unproletarian group could hardly have been invented. Its most celebrated outcome represented, in retrospect, a movement away from Marxism, assaulting American liberalism first from the left and then from the right moving toward a rationalist and Jewish equivalent of Catholic humanism with a secure hierarchy, this time of intellect rather than position and property, holding off the threat of the masses, especially the non-white masses. Its least celebrated, left-wing that is, outcome represented the opposite, the dissolution of Leninism into renewed syndicalism, radical race consciousness, and cultural anarchism directed against the bureaucratic state in its various capitalist and Stalinist incarnations. So Saul Bellow uh, was a Canadian-American writer who lived from 1915 to 2005. Won the National Book Award for Fiction three times. Man, this biography is too long. Gertrude Himmelfarb, who lived from 1922 to December 2019, known as Bia Kristoff, was an American historian. She was a leader of conservative interpretations of history and historiography. Gertrude Himmelfar wrote extensively on intellectual history with a focus on Britain and the Victorian era, as well as contemporary society and culture. Richard Hofstadter, who lived from 1916 to 1970, was an American historian and public intellectual of the mid-20th century. Richard Hofstadter was the Dwight Clinton Professor of American History at Columbia University. Rejecting his his earlier historical materialist approach to history, in the 1950s, Hofstadter became closer to the concept of, quote, consensus history, end quote, and was epitomized by some of his admirers as the, quote, iconic historian of post-war liberal consensus, end quote. Others see in Hofstadter's work an early critique of one-dimensional society as Hofstadter was equally critical of socialist and capitalist models of society and bemoaned the, quote, consensus, end quote, within society as, quote, bounded by the horizons of property and entrepreneurship, end quote, criticizing the, quote, hegemonic liberal capitalist culture running through the course of American history, end quote. Richard Hofstadter's widely read works are Social Darwinism in American Thought, 1860 to 1915, published in 1944, The American Political Tradition, 1948, The Age of Reform, 1955, Anti-Intellectualism in American Life, 1963, and the essays collected in The Paranoid Style in American Politics, 1964. Richard Hofstadter was twice awarded the Pulitzer Prize in 1956 for The Age of Reform and Analysis of the Populism Movement in the 1890s, 
and the progressive movement in the early 20th century, and in 1964 for the cultural history anti-intellectualism in American life. Richard Hofstadter was an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society. Clement Greenberg, occasionally writing under the pseudonym K. Hardesh, was an American essayist Clement Greenberg, who lived from 1909 to 1994, occasionally writing under the pseudonym K. Hardish, was an American essayist named mainly as an art critic, solely associ closely associated with the American modern art of the mid-20th century and formalist aestheticism. Clement Greenberg is best remembered for his association with the art movement Abstract Expressionism and the painter Jackson Pollock. Right, back to the text. James stood astride these centripetal tendencies, true to Leninism, but a Leninism successively reinterpreted. To the fears and anxieties aroused by the German conquest of France, James argued forcefully that Hitler could not win. An issue of the New International, written wholly by James, detailed his revolutionary predictions. The Nazis, James saw as the acme of stratification already apparent in Bismarck, and the famous Blitzkrieg, an old Prussian technique performed by modern technology. Collapse of the bourgeoisie and calculated destruction of the working class made possible a renewed German nationalism with unprecedented state orchestration. Demoralization of the working class in France, Holland, Spain, and elsewhere with the assistance of the communists rendered any internationalist revolutionary alternative with its own style of military resistance against Hitlerism an impossibility. But internationalism would rise again, James argued, because no alternatives existed for civilization. Quote, Capitalism, after climbing great heights, came to a standstill and has now slipped from its foundations. Great states crash. Communities of millions are torn up by the roots. Shocks, catastrophes, sudden reversals and denialations, drawn-out agonies, events unpredicted and unpredictable flow and will follow each other with bewildering speed. As we look at the film of history, it seems that the operator has gone mad. But through it all, the general line is clear. The objective hopelessness of the profit system, the stratification of production by the imperialist state, the reduction of the living standards of the people, political and social servitude, dot, 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 the crisis grows deeper every day, war is only one manifestation of it, end quote, C.O.R. James. These were the ideas by which the Workers' Party members at least initially urged themselves forward during the war, and pr the prism through which James wrote in the New International. Without doubt, it was first of all his range of knowledge which set James off from even the bright youngsters around him, and likely inspired the lifelong resentment against him by Irving Howe and others. The martyred Trotsky he viewed in the succession of Gibbon and Michelet, the unfolding events of the war in the mirror of 400 years. Sorry, the martyr Trotsky he viewed in the succession of Gibbon and Michelet, the unfolding events of the war in the mirror of 400 years European conflict, the potential socialist unity as realization of ideals put forward, albeit in religious and sectarian forms, in the Crusades. No one else in American Trotskyism, or indeed in American Marxist movements, could write or speak with this scope. The New International, thanks largely to James, shortly rose from the Trotsky-cheering section it had previously been to become the outstanding left journal in the USA. Secondly, James kept an eye toward Africa and Asia as the war promised the end of the British Empire it raised prospects of revolt previously quelled with resources no longer available to colonialism. Still an international figure of sorts, James also remained an executive of the International African Service Bureau and helped to plan the Fifth Pan-African Congress in 1945, which set out the pro-independence political agenda. 
James also planned with Richard Wright and others the publication of a black monthly opinion piece, which despite elaborate plans never saw the light. James also contributed in 1940 an extraordinary pamphlet to the rising anti-war sentiment of black Americans in, quote, my friends, end quote, a fireside chat on the war, James borrowed both the form of Franklin Roosevelt's informal talks and the imminent critique of Richard Wright made of American society. To speak in the voice of a self-educated worker, most extraordinarily, his worker, this worker's wife, quote, Leonora, who is red, end quote, presumably in line with the Communist Party's current isolationism, is credited with the most pungent, pungent criticisms. In a literary style that rang with vernacular, James's protagonist baited Roosevelt. Quote, My friends, who does the president want us to fight? He and all the writers in the papers say that it is to defend our democracy. Our democracy! Exclamation point. My friends, when I heard that, I laughed for ten minutes. Yes, laughed. I'll tell you why. It was because I was so damned mad that if I didn't laugh, I would have broken the radio, and the radio cost me four dollars in the pawn shop, and I didn't want to break it, dot, dot, dot. My friends, the president warns us about the fifth column. I understand this is the new name for the enemies of democracy. Where have the president's eyes been all this time? If he wants to find out who these fifth column people are, he just has to ask the Negroes. We know them. We spend our lives fighting against them. If the president sends a reporter to me with a large notebook, I guarantee that between sunrise and sundown tomorrow, I'll point out to him more fifth column enemies of democracy than he can find room for in all jail of the, all the jails of this country, beginning with Vice President of the United States, Jack Garner. Dot, dot, dot. I went to the last war. I was treated like a dog before I went. I was treated like a dog while I was there. I was treated like a dog when I returned. I have been paid for like for a sucker before. Excuse me, played for a sucker before. And I'm not going to be played again. End quote. As a pamphlet tier, James had limitless potential to test his talent for political leadership and his unusual views of the peasantry. James volunteered to go to southeastern Missouri in 1941, where he almost immediately became embroiled in the struggles of sharecroppers. Not that James turned agitator, Workers' Party members on the scene suggest he spent most of his time in St. Louis with only occasional forays in the countryside, essentially to encourage their incipient strike, listen to their story, and incorporate it into a second Workers' Party pamphlet. But James proved himself a good listener and an able scribe of another black vernacular, that of the rural region still virtually untouched by big city secularization. Quote, all the preachers must get their flock together and preach to them about the union and solidarity in the struggle, dot, dot, dot. This is the voice of scripture. Also, the laborer is worthy of his hire. That is scripture also, dot, dot, dot. Solidarity in the union, that is the way to get the kingdom of heaven upon earth, end quote. The sharecroppers won their strike, although their subsequent experience in the communist-dominated union of canning, agriculture, well, packing and allied workers, UCAPAW, would be disappointed for the reason that non-wage employees never fitted into the CIO's structure. Yet a victory had been scored by rural blacks in wartime with the aid of white CIO workers in St. Louis and under the ostensible guidance of a Trotskyist. Not only was this a single a signal, excuse me, a signal triumph, it was also unique. It would not happen in the rural South again soon. Meanwhile, James and Dunievskaya had moved toward forming a, quote, total, end quote, faction that its own ideas and support, with its own ideas and support network inside the Workers' Party. It was, to begin with, an enlarged study group composed largely of remarkable women around James intellectually and around a household turned into a kind of radical salon. Freddie Drake Payne. At there, at the residence of Freddie Drake Payne and of her husband and, and fellow political enthusiast, prominent architect Lyman Payne, James came and went with his own key, frequently led group discussions on subjects ranging from movies to economics and generally held court. 
The pains not only hosted the group, but also provided James's financial sustenance, as they would continue to do for almost a quarter century. With their help, he could rarely intellectually he could rally intellectual energies without imposing an ironclad dogma upon the comrades and the allies who came and went through this milieu. As a disciplined political cadre, cadre, it lacked substance, substance as well as numbers. But as a collective mind, at once intently serious and also creatively playful, it suited perfectly the era of new conceptual problems facing the left. By 1943, James could write to Constance Webb that despite an operation upon an ulcer, quote, these three years have been wonderful for me. I have at last got hold of Marxism, economic, parenthesis, capital, end quote, and philosophical, parenthesis, Hegelian dialectic, end parenthesis. I don't know all I want to know, but I have covered the ground and am not only, and not only in theory, but as a result of it in my daily work. I really can see that I am in command of things. These three years have been the most exciting intellectually of my life, and if I could have studied only because I was ill so much, I don't think I would have regretted it. There have been great battles, and some of it has been wearing, but that is politics. Dot, dot, dot. On the whole, I am satisfied with the past and very confident of the future. End quote. It was a heady experience for others in the group as well. A typical young woman fresh from factories and college on the West Coast served along with others as research aide for James and remembers the flush of excitement in the demands of doctrinal debate even when she had no particularly strong favorites among the debaters. She had become a, quote, Johnsonite, end quote, following James's American nom de plume, or, quote, Johnson Forrest, end quote, follower, largely because James alone among Trotskyist intellectuals had made provision for her to do useful work and to grow with the effort. James seemed to her, as he, had, as he must seem to others, overly Talmudic, also practically obsessed with the possibility of short-range dramatic change in America, but with all that still a charismatic theorist who inspired or enthralled devotees. Grace Lee, soon to be the third member of the group's leadership, similarly views the Johnson Forest tendency as a completion of her education and initiation into a lifelong involvement with serious political theory. Daughter of prominent Chinese American uh, uh, Chinese American restaurateur, Brent Marr philosophy PhD with a thesis on George Herbert Mead. Grace Lee had been swept up into politics during the excitement around the aborted March on Washington movement led by A. Philip Randolph. She had contacted the Workers' Party almost by accident through a small milieu around the University of Chicago submerged by Communist Party influence. The enthusiasm of Chicago blacks and her intellectual enthusiasm at CLR James led her to left politics study classes of Marx in the light of political developments and made Lee and her competence in German an indispensable addition to the group. Quite apart from James Proper, the role model of Marxist women, woman theorists provided by Raya Donievskaya had its own definite effect. Every Trotskyist had read Lurs of Luxembourg. They practically claimed her as one of their own. The aspiration for anything like Luxembourgian theoretical status by an American Marxist woman met, however, with jeers. In the Communist Party, women had been celebrated principally as heroic rank and filers, or, quote, mother, end quote, to the workers, a status which the redoubtable Elizabeth Gurley, Fr Gurley Flynn stoutly resisted, but not with complete success. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, uh, who lived from 1890 to 1964, was an American labor leader, activist, and feminist who played a leading role in the industrial workers of the world. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn was a founding member of the American Civil Liberties Union and, and a visible proponent of women's rights, birth control, and women's suffrage. She joined the Communist Party 
USA in 1936 and late in life in 1961 became its chairwoman. Elizabeth Gurley Flynn died during a visit to the Soviet Union where she was accorded a state funeral with processions in Red Square attended by over 25,000 people. Back to the text. Dunyevskaya was arguably the first to achieve and maintain her top rank status. Grace Lee could be described in a much, in a more restricted sense as the second and possibly the greatest so, I mean, the possibly the last until the rise of such feminist political veterans and Marxist academics as James influenced historian and women's movement spokesperson Linda Gordon in the 1960s and 70s. It says that Linda Gordon was, is an American feminist and historian. Linda Gordon lives in New York City and in Madison, Wisconsin. Linda Gordon won the Man Marfield Prize and the WILLA Literary Award in Historical Nonfiction for Dorothy Lang, A Life Beyond Limits, and the Antonovich Prize for Cossack Rebellion, Social Turmoil in 16th Century Ukraine. Back to the text. Practice join theory. For Lee, it was respect, retrospectively, quote, a marvelous time for going into the plant, end quote, and no less marvelous at a time to study Marxism. Optimism measured the course of the left at large. Orthodox Trotskyists observing the rightward political trend to a Republican Congress in 1942, the railroading of Socialist Workers' Party leaders into jail on a patently absurd charge of sedition and the concurrent loss of their Teamster influence did not particularly anticipate a silver lining. Buffeted by repression, the Socialist Workers' Party settled down to survive the military interregnum. The Communist Party, for its part, entered its own final golden age, flushed with the pro-Russian tilt of U.S. war policy and the emergence of an impressive female enrollment, a majority of the party's 1943 peak of 80,000 members at shopping community levels. Utterly opposed to Stalinism and repelled at its open abandonment of a proletarian, proletarian teleology, the little Johnson Forest group actually shared with the communists some similar sources for political hope more than the Workers' Party at large. The changes in the status of women, of blacks, and of industrial society at large filled them, with both eager, filled them both with eager anticipation. The difference between the Johnsonites and the communists, apart from the vast scale of one to a thousand, was that the communists had moved decisively away from the, quote, revolutionary defeatist, end quote, formulae of anticipated revolutionary outburst to the vision of a world ruled by liberal America and communist Russia in peaceful alliance. The Johnson Forest perspective refashioned the traditional Leninist strategic wisdom by reference to new stages of mass production and mass culture to fit the current situation. The great and calamitous events, war abroad and uncertainty at home, encouraged Johnson Forest followers. James could write privately in 1943, quote, I have at present in daily expectation of the beginning of an upheaval, dot, 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 marking the beginning of the socialist revolution. I think of that many hours of every day. It keeps me alive, end quote. On the negative side, as a 1940 resolution, the Workers' Party proclaimed the fascist state had, quote, deeper economic roots, end quote, than Marxists had hitherto acknowledged. The breakdown of economic capitalism had catapulted the state into command of economic forces, from which height it could become a vehicle for barbarism. The choices had therefore narrowed. Only the emancipation of labor could forestall barbarism. James himself, writing in 1945, after the atomic warfare against Japan and the revelations of German genocide against the Jews and others, had revealed the new situation, reformulating this idea as, quote, socialism and barbarism, end quote, simultaneously coming to fruition. On the positive side, James and his comrades greeted such various events as the 1943 Harlem riot, the wartime strikes, and the voting strength of the CIO's political action committee as potential mass mobilizations against the state's version of social peace.
Abroad, he saw the rise of European liberation forces as proletarian revolution and nuclei substituting themselves for broken national bourgeoisies. These tendencies were actually accelerated by the capitulation of the middling national forces to communism, the power of the Red Army on the one hand, and the concurrent rise of intellectualized versions of fascism, now designated clerical, quote, humanism, end quote, on the other. As James had predicted in 1940, one by one the alternatives had all but run out. Workers' Party intellectuals and factory... Oh, sorry, let me read this actually thing. The Harlem Riot of 1943 was a race riot that took place in Harlem, New York City on August 1st and 2nd of 1943 after a white police officer, James Collins, shot and wounded Robert Bandy, an African-American soldier, and rumors circulated that the soldier had been killed. The riot was chiefly directed by black residents against white-owned property in Harlem. It was one of five riots in the nation that year related to black and white tensions during World War II. The others took place in Detroit, Beaumont, Texas, Mobile, Alabama, and Los Angeles. Workers' Party, in back to the text. Workers' Party intellectuals and factory cadre, at once more trade unionists in their political approach and also more traditionally Trotskyists in their separation of theoretical discussion from mass agitation, found less and less common ground with the likes of James. The Holocaust, arousing as it did a deep guilt in the mind of Jews who had been less than enthusiastic in supporting the American war effort, confirmed a creeping despondence. Theses on, quote, historical retrogression, end quote, circulated by German Trotskyists, captured the mood. Capitalism had fallen apart, the Russians advanced, and the European society increasingly resembled that of the Dark Ages. The task of revolutionaries had become essentially one of restoring society from the verge of barbarism to a pre-socialism transition stage. If James believed that the degradation of the productive forces, quote, socializes labor, end quote, and, quote, drives it to revolt, end quote. The prevailing perspective held that degradation meant the end of all immediate revolutionary hopes. Indeed, it did for the Workers' Party, which did slid subtly downward after the war and dissolved into a propaganda group in 1940. The Workers' Party's foremost leader, Max Schachtman himself, drifted rightward to become architect of the AFL-CIO's hawkish Vietnam policy. Schachtman carried with him a stratum which embodied the extreme ideologues of Cold War labor leadership, instructing a younger generation of former socialists in the fine arts of subverting, subverting radical labor movements abroad and discrediting dissident radical or merely democratic trade union tendencies at home. Within a quarter century, they had become all that they had accused the communists of being, except that they embraced the American version of the Leviathan state. Other individuals of the old Shacktonite movement went on to distinguish themselves within just these sorts of dissident labor and social movements persecuted by their former comrades now in power. A handful A handful of Workers' Party alumni also played an invaluable role of bridging the political gap, at least for individuals, between the old and new left. The overwhelming majority came to the view, one way or another, that the classical Trotskyism or Bolshevism of the 1915-45 to period had indeed decisively come to an end, leaving its heirs in limbo. It would be too much to say that the philosophical and political differences among these, those moving in opposite directions consisted in approaches to the race and colonial question. But these differences, along with an unstated but unmistakable gender tilt, seem to underline the radical break Johnson Forrest made with the Workers' Party on ostensibly Leninist grounds in 1947. A young Italian-American woman with no political background drew close to James from her observation that he lectured as her mother, a sui generis Pentecostal Christian, had earlier preached about the, quote, backward ones, and quote, destined to rule over the world society. One of the, quote, backward ones, end quote, herself, she could feel a stirring throughout American society. James's ultimate disproof of, quote, retrogression, end quote, though hardly stated at the time, was the nationalist uprisings 
uprising in the third world that he had anticipated and helped to orient. A corollary more clearly stated was the increasingly black character of working class restiveness in the USA. The right-leaning defectors would come to view these developments with alarm and come to associate them with the, quote, retrogression, end quote, which threatened Western civilization. The left defectors would sometimes celebrate what their erstwhile comrades despised. The political logic, this political logic, barely identified at the time, carried the Johnson Forest group into the mainstream Trotskyist Orthodox Socialist Workers' Party from which the group had departed in 1940, just then enjoying an upswing of influence similar in character and duration to the Workers' Party wartime boomlet, the, the outnumbered Orthodox Trotskyists essentially filled the gap left by a declining Communist Party the best they knew how, assailing the retreat of union leaders from earlier class militancy, appealing over the heads of black and labor organizations for direct action tactics, and hailing the possibility of the breakthrough that no one else on the left seemed any longer to view as realistic. They had not changed their views on the character of the Soviet Union, nor formally or informally on the women question, nor on the general role of the vanguard leading American workers in old-style Bolshevik fashion. But they attracted new blood. In their own eyes, their time had come. Their lively cadre from the indigenous working class, augmented to be sure by, quote, colonizers, end quote, had persisted with promising results. Especially among semi-politicized black workers, they seemed to get a hearing. Veteran leader James Cannon, buoyed with optimism, proclaimed his hopes in a pamphlet, The Coming American Revolution. Johnson Forrest and the Socialist Workers' Party entered a mar marriage of convenience with James's group, retaining their internal coherence and discipline. The Socialist Workers' Party, utterly delighted to get the outstanding Trotskyist theorist on blacks, accepted the rest of the group with equanimity. As a bonus, it acquired a handful of valuable activists, such as the Johnsonite who put the weekly militant to bed, assigned a column on the Negro question, as if the plans of 1939 now continued almost a decade later, James did his task as well as his growingly difficult personal situation allowed. Local Johnsonites vowed not to fight over insoluble theoretical differences, striving instead to work on common issues. Here and there they found themselves engaged with industrial militants, whether with miners in West Virginia steel workers in Chicago, or even running for office on the Oakland, California Socialist Workers' Party local ticket. Wherever possible, they had tried to raise the possibility of mass mobilization and of a truly Americanized version of Marxist politics with this, within this framework. James sought to underpin the political development with a strategic understanding of the gap between the Socialist Workers' Party's modest means and the real radical potential. James called on occasional contribution to, excuse me, James called an occasional contribution to the militant, quote, ele the elemental urge to socialism, end quote, meaning the mass desire that existed regardless of political guidance or its absence, quote, any theory of party building or party organization which is not based on the needs and desires of experienced workers, he, end quote, he warned, would come to no good. Indeed, quote, Bolshevism, quote, Bolshevism, conscious of Bolshevism's roots, is constantly on the alert to examine and ponder over the slightest reactions of genuine proletarians to the concept of the party, the theory of the party, and the experiences of the party whether those experiences are favorable or not, end quote. A half dozen years later, in the Workers' Party, James appealed for a willingness to believe in the potential subjects of the revolution, quote, more than they believed in themselves, end quote, and for the courage to Americanize and update their international heritage to the prospects upon the horizon. This final dream by James of Trotskyism's revival drew swiftly to an end. By 1940-50, to 50, the Cold War and the successful implementation of factory discipline with trade union, with union leaders' ardent assistance left potential activists from the rank and file both discouraged and increasingly fearful of repression. While the remaining activists of the disintegrating Workers' Party tended to go over to the anti-communist unionists, especially, into, especially auto leader Walter Reuther, the floundering Socialist Workers' Party cadre now struggled to defend critically the communist-led 
progressive blocs. In some cases, again, that of the United Auto Workers, they actually became the spokespersons of these blocs so long as the following could be maintained. But the grounds for agitation constantly dwindled. According to some complaints, the factory blacks recruited into the Socialist Workers' Party found actual comradeship, including such touchy questions as black nationalism and the social engagement of black men with white women, considerably less than in the Communist Party milieu. Whether, whatever the reason, most of the new sympathizers soon departed, leaving a little behind. The return to 1930s-style class struggle never materialized, while the widening civil rights movement of the 1950s would bear many traces of post-Marxist influence, but not organic links with the left. just wanted to read, uh, look up Walter Voither. I'm just going to read the first paragraph of this by uh, Walter Philip Reuther, who lived from 1907 to 1970, was an American leader of organized labor and civil rights activists who built the United Automobile Workers into one of the most progressive labor unions in, the Amer in American history. Walter Reuther saw labor movements not as near as special interest groups, but as instruments to advance social justice and human rights in democratic societies. Reuther leveraged the United Auto Workers' resources and influence to advocate for workers' rights, civil rights, women's rights, universal health care, public education, affordable housing, environmental stewardship, and nuclear nonproliferation around the world. Reuther believed in Swedish-style social democracy and societal change through nonviolent civil disobedience. Reuther co-founded the AFL-CIO in 1955 with George Meany. Reuther survived two attempted assassinations, including one at home where he was struck by a 12-gauge shotgun blast fired through his kitchen window. Reuther was the first and fourth and longest-serving president of the United Worker Auto Workers, serving from 1946 until his death in 1970. Right, back to the text. Struggles against the onset of the Cold War and its various repressions increasingly dominated the reserve energy remaining. Campus activism briefly spread around the 1948 presidential campaign of Henry Wallace. Communists sank all their energy and hopes into the effort, alienating key trade union supporters who remained in the Harry Truman camp and bringing on the Progressive Party charges of disloyalty. The Socialist Workers' Party, with, like the collapsed Socialist Party, ran its own candidates in total isolation. Working class issues in their own right virtually disappeared. As the Workers' Party dissolved in 1949 into an avowed propaganda group drifted rightward on world issues, the Socialist Workers' Party increasingly attached themselves to fantasies of heretical communist regimes such as Tito's in Yugoslavia becoming favorable toward the Fourth International. All this for James and his followers seemed either blundering or downright anathema. They had no further reason for remaining within such a current. But how to set out a whole new course in accordance with their underlying faith in working class capacity and their hopes for emerging racial dynamics? The, the strain between evolving post-vanguardist views and the stubborn faith of loyal Trotsky has snapped the links. Surprising even some of its less centrally connected sympathizers, the group withdrew suddenly from the Socialist Workers' Party in 1950. James now led his following into the political wilderness, or out of the wilderness of the insular left into the Valley of Promise somewhere in American life. Beyond Trotskyism. Organizationally, in terms of numbers, let alone public influence, the Johnson Forest Group had made no particular progress in its pilgrimage through Trotskyism. But from a theoretical standpoint, it had been an immensely rich several years. The flow of materials, pamphlets, and books surpassed any other period in James's own life in particular. It was also the most inherently collective intellectual work he would ever undertake. One measure could be found in pamphlets published during the interim period between Trotskyist organizations and just after final secession about the lives of ordinary workers. 
A similar effect had been made repeatedly, excuse me, effort had been made repeatedly since the founding of American Marxism to capture the ambi ambiance both faithfully and optimistically. Perhaps the most successful result had come in the unpretentious Yiddish literature written by real workers or slum dwellers, or in the later reportage by such straightforward commentators as Ruth McKenney. Most of it by mean by no means all of the communists assuming. Yiddish literature written by real workers or slum dwellers or in the later reportage by such straightforward commentators as Ruth McKenney, her Industrial Valley, a nineteen thirty nine look at Akron, Ohio. Most, if by no means all of the communist fiction had been marked by narrow didacticism and unrealistic political conclusions. Trotskyist intellectuals, so far as they interested themselves in fiction rather than criticism, had, again with exceptions, moved steadily away from class to aesthetic experiments. Only in the closing years of the 1940s and early 1950s did a handful of varied and personally disconnected communist, Trotskyist, and independent succeed in moving beyond literary pamphleteering to careful literary realism. James's group collectively sought a parallel path in nonfiction, workers revealing through an intellectual Aminoinus, their inner world of observations, frustrations, and dreams. It says that Aminoinus, or Aminuinus, Amanuensis, Amanuensis, Jesus Christ, that's not Amanuensis, a literary or artistic assistant, in particular one who takes dictation or copies manuscripts. And it says here that Ruth McKenney was an American author and journalist best remembered by for My Sister Eileen, a memoir of her experiences growing up in Ohio and moving to Greenwich Village with her sister Eileen McKenney. Originally published as a series of short stories, My Sister Eileen was published as a book in book form in 1938 and later adapted under the same name into a play, a radio play, an unproduced radio series, two films, and a CBS television series. It was also the basis for Leonard Bernstein's musical, Wonderful Town. Back to the text. The Johnsonites published most of their text in two waves during the, quote, interim period of 1947, between the workers' and socialist workers' parties, and after the split from the socialist workers' party in 1951 to 2, the American Worker, published in 1947 by Paul Romano and Rhea Stone, I think he's like, that's his nom de plume, of uh, a guy named Phil Singer, I think is who. Um, and and Rhea Stone, I believe, is Grace Lee. Um, the American Worker, published by Paul Romano and Rhea Stone, pseudonyms for a worker who told his story in Grace Lee, who both wrote it down and added a commentary, offered a snapshot of the factory and a chiseled analysis of blue-collar psychology. Indignant Heart, published in 1952, supplied the book-length life of, quote, Matthew Ward, end quote, as told in effect to Constance Webb, a black worker who had migrated from the south of Detroit, worked in the auto plants and been progressively discouraged from both the communists and Trotskyists, but not from promise, the promise of radicalism. Lee's translation of passages from Marx's 1844 economic and philosophic, economic philosophic manuscripts, focusing upon the ineradicable alienation of wage labor, illuminated the very empirical points raised by daily life. No one else inside the left or outside it went so far in either direction. James Dunyev, Sky, and Lee, meanwhile, wrestled with the world events in the light of their theories. A substantial pamphlet, The Invading Socialist Society, published in 1947, 
established the extraordinary insight for the time that communist parties around the world were not mere, quote, tools of the Kremlin, end quote, as Trotsky's theory of all kinds claimed, but rather were, quote, an organic product of the mode of capitalism at this stage, end quote. In short, the state's growth had become an inevitable and the only possible bulwark against socialism, the decadent Second International and the Stalinist Third International parties could not and would not disabuse their followers of the illusion that state property equaled socialism. Each viewed the collapse of capitalism from this standpoint, although awaiting different kinds of liberators. The Johnsonites, on the contrary, called for revolutionaries, quote, to drive as clear a line between bourgeois nationalization and proletarian nationalization as the revolutionary Third International drew between bourgeois democracy and proletarian democracy, end quote. The slogan, the Socialist United States of Europe, carried forward the necessity of abolishing existing national boundaries as a step in true reconstruction. Engels' own formulation, quote, the invading socialist society, end quote, had foreshadowed and predicted the transition from statification to socialism. State Capitalism and World Revolution, published in 1950, brought this critique almost to a full-length book. Argued as in the earlier pamphlet with logic extremely internal to contemporary Trotskyism, the document savaged in particular the Trotskyist adaptation to heretical communists in power. Such an adaptation, James and his collaborators argued, meant the acceptance of nationalization, rationalized as, quote, national unity, end quote, against foreign domination as the virtual accomplishment of socialism. Trotskyists had, in effect, substituted the bureaucracy and state power for class struggle against the bureaucracy. Excuse me. Trotskyists had, in effect, substituted the bureaucracy and state power for class struggle against the bureaucracy and every other kind of ruling elite. Trotskyists had exchanged visions of intra-bureaucratic power struggles for the old dream of proletarian emancipation. According to the Johnsonite analysis, Tito merely wavered between Cold War camps. Tito did not begin to approach socialism any more than the competing superpowers did. Purporting to defend the revolutionary tradition of Trotskyism, the authors proposed to disabuse themselves of Trotsky's own key methodological terms. The heart of the, their analysis linked modern capitalism to Russian, quote, state capitalism, end quote, the bureaucratic plan, the logic of experts, i.e. rationalism in power, capital R rationalism in power, was the essence of updated exploitation. James's perceptual penetration of the CIO struggle, his analysis of the communist support for bureaucratic tendencies within the labor movement, extended this insight into the process of revolutionary transformation and the limitations of conventional Marxist wisdom. James and his collaborators argued that American workers, however unwilling they might have been historically to join socialist parties in European standard, were not backward in the most important sense. The instinctual grasping for the universal, capital E universal, no more change, excuse me, no mere change in the form of property, but rather in the social relations of production could be seen in the actions of 1940s workers urgently seeking the negation of existing relations. The CIO, quote, more political party than trade union, end quote, had embodied the initial phase of their striving. Stripped of its bureaucracy, the CIO might embody once more the greatest challenge that the exploited had ever set before modern capitalism where workers would find their own forms to do what had to be done. In any case, the challenge had to come as a necessary response to the level of contradiction already reached within American capitalism. The system of sweated labor pioneered by Ford threatened to become a comprehensive totalitarianism. Scientifically rationalized production with the state as mediator marked the culmination of the industrial and political evolution which had been centuries in the making. Triumphant, it would signify the subordination of every democratic possibility to the demands of capital. Concurrent with that development at every step, however, were elements of resistance from the weavers of the medieval, quote, free cities, end quote, to the British levelers and diggers, to the Paris communards, and finally, the members of the Russian Soviets. James argued in a separate document that the idea of freedom had been rendered successively more concrete throughout Western history despite calamitous defeats suffered along the way. J 
James noted that when the slaves of antiquity made their claim upon freedom for all in God and equality in heaven, they also made their claim upon an abstract freedom. Unlike his mostly Jewish opposite numbers still in the Workers' Party, James did not view the triumph of Christianity or its role in medieval times as proof of the Dark Ages. From era to era, the struggle had continued, the prospects inherent in ordinary modern workers and their mutual relations to each other would fill in the abstraction long present such was the promise of socialism. The difficulty of seeing this outcome at the very moment of civilized collapse, the shambles left from modern warfare, offered James proof positive of the need for reviving the methods of the dialectic against the false reality of rationalism. From this point, James advanced to his prime philosophical document, Notes on Dialectics. Rarely, at least until the structuralist documents of the 1970s, has so difficult a text been presented to the American Marxist reader. Never before or since has it been presented in the framework of interpreting proletarian action through the guidance of Hegelian logic. The document came together at a strangely significant personal moment. Almost since his arrival in America, James had written impassioned letters to Constance Webb. James had expressed in private and artistic intuitions excuse me, expressed in private the artistic intuitions that he repressed from his public writings, his excitement at American culture, especially American cinema, his sense of personal insecurity at learning, at earning a living or even remaining safely in the country on an outdated visa. He had agonized not at his advanced age in itself, but at his inability to secure a stable relationship alongside his political life. At last, after the refusal of U.S. authorities to accept a divorce from his Trinidadian wife, he went through a variety of legal stratagems to marry Webb. To free himself formally, James had to risk exposure and deportation. Taking all risks in hand, he set out for the divorce mill of Reno, Nevada, working uncharacteristically as a gardener handyman. There he set down in a series of letters the political philosophical conclusions he had reached by turning repeatedly from text to contemporary political life. Just as an imagined life with Constance Webb seemingly symbolized for James a successfully completed Americanization, so his intellectual work on Hegel meant the fruition of a decade's Marxist study and observation. James intended to work through, in, in philosophical detail, the theoretical steps taken already. Hegel's logic provided, he insisted, a, quote, algebra in constant movement, end quote suitable for any dialectical process, but especially suited for the great social transformations then at hand. Fundamentally, James categorized all the old perspectives, second internationalist and Trotskyist, as frozen in the realm of, quote, understanding, end quote, capital U, understanding. These had seized upon a historical development, the 19th and early 20th century workers struggle against private property and set themselves upon the goal of state ownership. Understanding could be underrated or done without. But falling short of reason by want of a leap, in the spirit that Lenin wrote, quote, leap, 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 end quote, in his notebook on Hegel, it failed in the first instance to comprehend the role of subject, real living subjects. Trotskyism, therefore, failed to transcend the categories of Lenin's 1903-23 era. Trotsky had been unable to convince, excuse me, conceive that the Russian Revolution, the highest stage reached in revolutionary struggle, had succumbed to state capitalism. Faced with the transformation of the world communist movement to popular frontism, he could only conclude that Stalinists had, quote, supple spines, end quote, or could prove themselves capable of anything. James returned to the lance he had split with Trotsky in 1939, and the conclusion Trotsky should have drawn about the German catastrophe, quote, The policy in Germany as far back as 1930 should have been governed by the idea that the workers at all costs should act over the heads of their organizations, end quote. Quote, true reality, end quote, James quoted Hegel as saying, quote, is merely this process of reinstating self-identity, or reflecting into its own self in and from its other, end quote. That was the key to the alternative view. The labor movement at each stage, quote, degenerates but splits to reinstate its self-identity, its unity, but, dot, 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 
This unity concerned divisions within its own self, end quote. Stalinism, like Bernsteinism before it, was part of the historical process. What could the new stage be? James insisted that the Paris Commune and the Soviets had shown the way forward in the dissolution of economics and politics into each other at the moment of revolutionary transformations. That had been Lenin's struggle after 1920, to bring the Russian people into the governing of the state and replacement of the bureaucracy. Decades later, a still more philosophical James would credit Mao Zedong, despite his own bureaucratic origins, with similar intentions in the Cultural Revolution. Um, I think there's a piece, I have a piece on here by uh, Matthew, Matthew uh, Quest um, titled something like C.L.R. James's, uh, The Problems of C.L.R. James's uh, Historical Understanding of uh, Lenin and the, and the Question of Workers' Democracy. I think he also has a piece in Insurgent Notes, which is where that article that I just mentioned is from, uh, about C.L.R. James's uh, confused understanding of Mao Zedong. The secret of the Soviets was the possibility of such a transformation. The tragedy of Russia was the impossibility under conditions of revived world capitalism. Quote, the revolutionary concept of 1917 was, for Lenin, the Soviet and what it means to the people, dot, 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 not nationalized property, but the Soviet plus nationalized property, electrification plus the Soviets, end quote. Lenin, James insisted, had never viewed his role as the originator of the party concept, combining in himself the culmination of a process from Kant's insistence upon human thought as source of cognition, and Hegel's insistence upon thought as definition of humaneness, or humanness, and of Marx's insistence upon man as a labor-using animal. Lenin had added that, quote, proletarian man is revolutionary or he is nothing, end quote. The party was... Oh, the bunnies are out. It's springtime, dude. Bunnies are out. They're big. They're big guys. Big bunnies. Oh, they're chasing each other. Around. This is magic. They fucking. Combining in himself, Lenin James says had never viewed his role. Shit, shit, where am I? The party was a mere means to this end. The proletariat's way of knowing itself, i.e., its mission. Each great thought belonged to a particular age. Another concept, another step in the great evolution, will be required for the mid 20th century. Put differently, James saw the progression from Cromwell and the French Revolution to the Commune and the Soviets as the successive development and degeneration of the petty bourgeoisie, first triumphant and then caught between the ruling classes above and the working class below. It carried through the French Revolution, but only on the condition that the mass movement be subordinated to itself. In substituting itself for the revolution, the intermediate class supplied the first great clue to state capitalism. It could not suppress the masses, its own social weapon, but neither could it permit them to take power in their own name and to dissolve the state into themselves. Much had changed in the intervening period, but the petty bourgeoisie had remained an intermediate class the stuff of which socialist and communist party leadership was made. Labor leadership, accompanied by an anarchist petty bourgeoisie, seemed only succeeded it. In the struggle that developed from the mid-20th century, excuse me, the mid-19th century to the first years of the 20th, but actually grew into its likeness, embodying the Mensheviks and later Stalinists. Through the labor leadership, they blunted the proletarian th thrust in the name of socialism itself. Rather than small property owners, they were the technical administrators of capital and state capital. In that capacity, they would rule or ruin. This petty bourgeoisie, Menshevik or Stalinist, would not defend private property. But it would murder a class, destroy a society if necessary, to prevent the abolition of itself as guiding force. Notes on dialectics revealed how far James had traveled to the study of counter-revolution with 
in the revolution. James had observed how much hostility workers, especially American workers, felt toward the bureaucratic obstacle. However unconscious they remained of the significance, and he closed with a dread, dread portrait of possibilities. Quote, the world moves to civil war and imperialist war or imperialist civil war. They are being prepared openly before the people, dot, dot, dot. Year by year, for 30 years, this is the course bourgeois society has taken. Since 1933, 15 years ago, it has gone downward without a pause. It has been worthwhile writing this, if only to settle for ourselves why, when we propose that the Fourth International orient itself around telling the workers that they alone in every country have the power to alter this and that, only by their independent power, our most violent opponents are not workers but the Trotskyists themselves. As I have been writing this, one thing keeps popping into my head and I cannot drive it out. Their organizations stagnate and dwindling, excuse me, their organizations stagnate and dwindling, they stand impregnable, ready to go down with the proletariat on the basis of their analysis that the workers are not ready. I think of the Stalinists in Germany in 1933 and in Spain in 1938. They too explain that their treacherous compromises are due to the fact that the workers are not ready. Dialectic explains their difference and their identity. End quote. Notes on dialectic summed up, perhaps, the dangers of historical generalization and also of political hyperbole. The attribution of all revolutionary failures to the malfeasance of the petty bourgeoisie failed, at the very least, to perceive that all non-spontaneous American radical movements, from abolitionism and women's rights to the First International onward, owed their formation and intellectuals to the same class. The very craft worker whose artisanal legacy stretched backward in time and whose gradual loss of status lay behind Marx's support in England, Germany, and elsewhere, had, as Thorstein Veblen pointed out, a, quote, small property, end quote, holding in his head and hands. Neither Marx nor Lenin nor Trotsky nor the various American Marxist intellectuals, with few exceptions, could make any other claim for themselves as individuals. Indeed, more descended, like Engels, from some wing of the large bourgeoisie than from the downcast proletariat. James's views offered an insight into the revolutionary process, but by cathartic gesture aimed at the energy of defeat, so he aimed all the energy of defeat away from the internal structures of the working class. The proletariat therefore ceased, despite all James's theoretical efforts to be the subject of history and became object once more. The quote, giant in chains, end quote, somehow always betrayed by leadership. A more Trotskyist view, broadened from the critique of Stalinism outward, could not have been formulated. But James, even straining at his own logic, had all the virtues of his faults. The micro-argument of notes on dialectics stood with a theory, theoretical context, which provided a corrective. The larger interpretation made elsewhere of the alienating division between mental and manual labor under capitalism showed the disintegration of society and the mobilization of capital, quote, for the suppression of its own creation, the need for the so social expression that the modern productive forces instills into every living human being, end quote. Marxism, he argued, consisted in the recognition that the resulting explosion, and not some moral appeal, or for that matter, the state seizure of productive facilities, would make the revolution, capital R. James and his colleagues had discovered a hidden marks long before anyone else in the United States because the stresses and strains upon the working class and the entire population made that discovery theoretically obligatory and because the Johnsonites had the intellectual energy to make the connection. In another sense, James had acted with any context in which arguments for the, quote, backwardness, end quote, of workers and ordinary people in general had become more common coin in the left than official publications would admit. The decline of the communist, Trotskyist, and socialist movement alike, the absence of a revolutionary breakthrough in the wake of the Second World War, made all but the most hardened cadre begin to doubt the subjects of their own devotion. James insisted upon a revolutionary way out because all other avenues had been blocked. Or again, he insisted upon the potentially revolutionary energy of an emerging generation, which felt sickened by world events and the stream of propaganda lies from East and West, but which bo had, by and large, lost the old-fashioned urge to read about socialism and to put their ideas into political action. 
This proletariat and middle class was indeed spontaneous in its actions, or it was nothing, nothing to socialism in the immediate future anyway. James's Trotskyist critics, if they read the philosophical theses at all, would surely have cited James's fondness for Hegel's claims that apparent mysticism actually hid, quote, speculative truth, end quote. Independently of Hegel's claims, they had long seen James as a mystic. James's mid-1940s challenge for anyone to disprove the possibility of the workers' uprising within a few years provided much fruit for satire in the disintegrating workers' party. It goes almost without saying that in the factional hothouse atmosphere of Trotskyism, opponents viewed the Johnson Forest group as a personality cult held together by James's mesmeric machinations. He had similarly by 1946 come to the point of suggesting that the post-war Italian Communist Party of many millions had nearly itself substituted mass for party, abolishing the contradiction, raising the possibility that in a crisis situation, even Stalinism might become its opposite. Ten years later, amid the Hungarian Revolution, James would find his vindication in the substitution of the mass for the party of any kind. Another fifteen years, and he would insist against the background of Poland that notes on dialectics had become his most valuable work. Where had James come in the little over a decade since his entry into the United States? The struggle for adaptation perhaps goes back to the initial object of Trotsky's inquiry, the Negro question. One could draw a straight line from James's observation about Garveyism in A History of Negro Revolt to the culmination of his decade-long wrangling with American Trotskyists on the question in the groundbreaking 1948 conference document, The Revolutionary Answer to the Negro Problem in the U.S. James based the high estimation of Garvey's impact not on back-to-Africa politics, but rather on the sense of pride racial and international solidarity against centuries of oppression that Garvey aroused. He had learned much from black nationalism he initially opposed. What James called the familiar, quote, social service attitude, end quote, of the left could never stoke the, quote, the fires that smolder in the Negro world, end quote, but showed themselves vividly in social life. Quote, let us not forget that in Neg the Negro people, their sleep and are now awakening passions of a violence exceeding, perhaps, as far as these things can be compared, anything among the tremendous forces that capitalism has created. Anyone who knows them, who knows their history, is able to talk to them intimately, watches them in their churches, reads their press with a discerning eye, must recognize that although their social force may not be able to compare with the social force of a corresponding number of organized workers, the hatred of bourgeois society and the readiness to destroy bourgeois society when the opportunity should present itself rests among them to a degree greater than in any other section of the population in the United States. James. Through that perception, moreover, James could follow and extend Du Bois in turning the concept of American history around. Blacks had, with their allies, the white abolitionists, forced the bourgeoisie toward civil war. Only by their emancipation could that struggle have been won and the South be truly reconstructed. Only through their sources could a populist movement have restrained the, relevant, me, the relentless march of an advancing capitalism, and only by their actual advance could the CIO come into its own. With broadening, deepening relevance to the revolutionary prospect, the independent black movement precipitated the political development of American socialism. No American radical, not even the black nationalist intellectual, sometimes in alliance with the Communist Party, had gone so far. None would carry these ideas further until the black power phase of the 1960s. That James's views became gospel for the later orthodox Trotskyist movement is a minor, parenthesis, although interesting, and parenthesis concern. With indirect links to the white left recognition of Malcolm X and the Socialist Workers Party's eager support of his, attentive, his tentative socialism just prior to his assassination. More important, James had set himself against communist fundamentals in a precise fashion without renouncing the Leninist legacy of direct political involvement. It may well be wondered whether James's definition of the shop floor struggle as, quote, socialism, dot, 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 the only socialism, end quote, could possibly encompass his current observations on Afro-American community life. 
Likewise, James had little appreciation for the ways in which the contradictions he observed bore fruit within the Communist Party, the important unions and pro-black organizations that it led. The observers who had declared him, quote, no Negro, end quote, had not been far wrong. But perhaps only from the outside, and with the terms of the argument somewhat simplified, could James have seen so clearly how the weight of institutions hung over the proletarian quest. Only from the outside could James particularize that insight to the rebellious response of black workers who identified least with the emerging, quote, new men of power, end quote, as C. Wright Mills would identify the labor leadership. True to Marx, James saw the proletariat as the embodiment of the revolutionary prospect. Even his San Domingo slaves of the 19th century, quote, working and living together in gangs of hundreds on the huge sugar factories, dot, 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 were closer to a modern proletariat than any group of workers in existence at that time, and bracket there and bracket rising was therefore a thoroughly prepared and organized movement, end quote. Not prepared by some external agent, but by the conditions of life and work, and with, with a natural leadership thrown up in self-conscious striving for a better life. The modern class struggle pressed home the ultimate proletarian goals, abolition of hierarchies invested through the division of mental and manual labor. Better than contemporary sociologists, James saw measures like dues check off as proof that emerging labor leaders, communist or anti-communist, who thought in terms of industrial rationalization and international consumer marketing, thus assuming their rightful place alongside the corporate opposite members, constituted the quote American bureaucracy carried to its ultimate and logical conclusion, end quote. He could see as ordinary socialist, communists, and Trotskyists could not the significance of state capitalist functionaries and progress willingly compromising the integrity of the proletarian impulse, not for personal gain, as the Trotskyists ordinarily charged, but according to a higher logic. They had repudiated private capitalism without believing that the classic proletariat of Karl Marx could in the foreseeable future rule itself. The mobilization and free expression of the proletarian millions of their world historic universality, no longer empirical but completely self-conscious, would entail the total mobilization of all forces in society, quote, that and nothing else can rebuild the vast wreck which is the modern world, end quote. Johnson Forrest lacked in retrospect the human forces to do much more than nurture a theoretical approach and a laboratory practice of an alternative to Trotskyism. It came to view itself as such an alternative only by the early 1950s, a decade after its appearance. As James later recalled, the clinging on to old forms reflected Bolshevik mentality. Quote, the idea that if you had the correct policies, then you were able to play, parenthesis, bracket, plan, question mark, end bracket. It's probably saying that like it should be plan, not play. So the way the way the sentence makes sense. So I'll just read it with that, like that. Okay. Quote, the idea was that if you had the correct policies, then you were able to play the correct party, play in the correct party, and by means of the correct party, ultimately you would lead the revolution to success. There was a great deal of misunderstanding of the struggles that Lenin had made in Russia to get his party right, but the general opinion was that you fought for the correct line of the party, however small you were, you fought against those who were not prepared to accept your line, and through your success, along with ra these rather narrow and limiting efforts, you would in time rise to being the dominant political party and lead the hundreds of millions of people in the United States. It may seem now that I'm speaking about it with irony, but I had more or less the same ideas rather more than less. All of us had it at that time, end quote. Having committed himself to the life of the vanguard, James saw it through to the end. Beyond that lay his recovery of the culture critique. End of chapter. Thanks for listening.